Hello, this is Dr. Benjamin Strong, the Chief Medical Officer of Virtual Radiologic, or VRAD. Welcome to my presentation on Extremity CTA. Before discussing uh, issues around accuracy and interpretive errors, I like to put everything in context with a description of VRAD's quality assurance system and where we lie relative to other published quality assurance data. So over its 20 years of existence, VRAD has been overread to an extraordinary percentage, mainly due to the predominance of preliminary interpretations in our study mix. So over all these years, you can see this purple line at the bottom is actually our QA rate over time in major misses per 1,000 studies. And that, over 20 years, has averaged about 1.3 major misses per 1,000 studies. Now, to compare that to other literature, the Wilson-Wong study is probably the largest and the most relevant study out there in that it was applied to overnight teleradiology, uh, which is the main uh, center of focus for VRADS cases as well. That brought things in at over five major misses per thousand studies, uh, more than three times the QA rate we see at VRAD. Other published literature include the SAFA study, which was from Dallas. That was a smaller study of only 700 patients, and they were trauma patients. So, of course, there were many more findings and therefore many more misses, and that ranked as high as 30 major misses per thousand. And then lastly, the other oft-cited publication in the QA literature is the Wu meta-analysis. And any statistician will tell you that meta-analysis is just another word for garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> but anyway, that one brought things in at under 25 major misses per thousand. So VRAD stands in, in very good shape in relation to published literature. And I believe this is a legitimate, true difference uh, it, and it's related to the exposure to overreading that we have at Virtual Radiologic, which has imbued us all with a culture, I think, of extreme quality. We categorize every QA we receive by both pathology and anatomic region. So we have stats now going back over three years. And this particular chart is 2019 through 2021 inclusive. So I'll give you the punchline right away. The most frequently missed entity is the pulmonary embolism. And that's, again, three years worth of data. So second is the spine fracture, with fracture coming in as the largest class of pathologies that are missed. And then third place is the intracranial hemorrhage. So we use this information to choose the algorithms we use for artificial intelligence, and also to choose the curricular topics that we address in our CME presentations. So why are we doing extremity CTA? Well, the other input we have in determining these things is medical malpractice. I did a review of 45 medical malpractice cases that closed over a period of four years. Those cases spanned about nine years in total, but they closed over a four-year period with an indemnity, meaning either a jury award or a settlement payment. So of those 45 cases, there were 35, so seven ninths, that I found were exclusively, specifically related to a diagnostic error by the radiologist. There were other factors in the other 10 cases, but there's no question in my mind that 35 cases were avoidable and were exclusively related to a diagnostic error. So here are the pathologies and how they were represented. And as you can see, epidural abscess, aortic dissection, and ischemic bowel certainly are very important, the most important things. And that's what our algorithm development and CME have been focused on in the last few years. But note as well, popliteal abnormalities amounted to more than a million dollars in indemnities, two out of the 35 cases. So around 6% of avoidable errors were actually on extremity CTAs. So with that, we will get into our extremity CTA case. The next case is a popliteal laceration. This was actually a complication of arthroscopy. 
So you can see the popliteal contrast column is absent here. It does reconstitute distally, but in the intervening segment in the popliteal fossa, there is this ill-defined contrast collection consistent with extravasation. Uh, the edges are quite fuzzy and there's a great deal of soft tissue stranding in the popliteal fossa, so that is more consistent with extravasation. There we lose the popliteal contrast column, there was the extravasation. We have all these soft tissue changes before distal reconstitution right at the very end of the image set. So again, lose the popliteal column there, and this is something I would call a laceration slash dissection, as I so often do in traumatic vessel injuries. All right, so that is a popliteal laceration with extravasation. Our next case is a popliteal dissection. You can see there is a transverse filling defect in the popliteal artery here, as well as an abnormal shape configuration to that contrast column. It should be a perfect circle, or at least a perfect oval at any level, and obviously this one is more oblong and uh, clearly not a circle. So distally, the interesting thing about this case is that popliteal dissection gave rise to distal embolization that occlude, in turn, the perineal artery, the posterior tibial artery, and the anterior tibial artery. So all three of the leg vessels ultimately were occluded by distal embolization related to that dissection right there in the popliteal artery. So we go down and we'll see it. We lose the perineal, posterior tibial, and anterior tibial arteries due to distal embolization. Here's the blown up view. There's that transverse filling defect in the abnormal shape of the popliteal vessel. Now we lose the perineal deep to the fibula, the posterior tibial on the posterior aspect of the interosseous membrane, and the anterior tibial on the anterior aspect of the interosseous membrane. So that is a popliteal dissection with distal embolization. Our next case is of atrial fibrillation. So of course with these cardiac sources, there could be emboli anywhere, and you have to be very careful to check the abdomen and pelvis on a runoff study to look for thromboembolic events. So the places to look, of course, are particularly the spleen and the kidneys, but of course the superior mesenteric artery is an extremely important potential victim of thromboembolization from a cardiac source. So distally, we can see we've lost the popliteal contrast column and distal to that, we've also lost the posterior tibial. So when you see distal embolization in a runoff, don't forget the possibility of a cardiac source. This patient had significant cardiomegaly, as you just saw, right? And go up and make sure the abdomen is also fr is free of embolic phenomena. So here we're going to lose the popliteal, and then more distally, we will lose a reconstituted posterior tibial. right there. So that again is a case of atrial fibrillation. Don't forget about the abdomen and pelvis when you're looking for embolic phenomena. Our next case is a popliteal aneurysm with in situ thrombosis. You can tell this is an aneurysm. You've got a rounded density here in the popliteal region and curvilinear calcification denoting the presence of a vascular lesion. So again, this was in situ thrombosis, which certainly happened to these uh, aneurysms. So there's some relatively fresh clot there, expansion of the aneurysm, and that curvilinear calcification, which tells you this is a vascular lesion. There is distal constitution there. But this is important to distinguish from thromboembolism, although, of course, you still have to do the same uh, distal search for emboli, because, of course, this could embolize distally as easily as a focal vessel injury. So that is a popliteal aneurysm.
Our next case is a mycotic aneurysm. Again, we have a dilation of the popliteal artery and the curvilinear calcification denoting the presence of a vascular lesion. But this case is different in that there is also intraluminal gas. And certainly in the absence of surgery or penetrating trauma, that suggests the possibility of an infection. And that is what this was. There was bacterial seeding of the wall of this aneurysm, and it resulted in vessel destruction, as you can see, but also significant inflammatory slash infectious change in the surrounding soft tissues. Was that seeding of a pre-existing aneurysm, or did the seeding result in an aneurysm, which would be a true mycotic aneurysm? Uh, more likely this was seeding of a pre-existing aneurysm, I should think, given the extent of calcification. So that is a, an infected, a super-infected popliteal aneurysm, possibly a mycotic aneurysm, but as I uh, mentioned, it may not have gone in exactly that sequence of events. Our next case is an interesting sort of metabolic one. This is a patient who had an overdose of cocaine, and this was some time ago, so I don't know that that was mixed with all the other drugs that you would, uh, you would see in an overdose today. So as best we know, this patient just had had a, uh, an excessive amount of cocaine, but look at the vasoconstriction it's causing, even there in the pelvic vessels, but also distally in the extremities. Those are femoral arteries, just incredible, and essentially almost invisible, just pinprick leg vessels are visible here. So the entirety of his extremity circulation, even as uh, far up as his pelvis, was all just in an extreme vasoconstrictive state. That's a very interesting manifestation of a drug overdose. You might see this with ergotamine therapies as well, some uh, migraine medications. Uh, can have a similar effect. So that is extensive vasoconstriction due to cocaine toxicity. Our next case is simply a straightforward case of deep venous thrombosis. I just want to remind everybody to look for these sorts of filling defects. Uh, oftentimes when we do runoffs, they're in the arterial phase, um, and that can make this this determination that much more difficult. But do just remember to keep an eye out for it. If you can't see a filling defect in the proper venous phase, perhaps look for the secondary changes that you're seeing here as well. The subcutaneous edema and the difference in thigh circumference are apparent even if you don't have appropriate venous contrast right there. So that is an extensive case of deep venous thrombosis involving the superficial uh, and deep femoral veins all the way through the popliteal. Deep venous thrombosis. And a vascular lecture would not be complete without a case of May Thurner syndrome. You can see here there is iliac artery, an iliac artery causing compression of the left iliac vein, common iliac. So that's the right common iliac artery. Can, you can see is slightly indenting the anterior aspect of the left common iliac vein, and there is a filling defect within it consistent with thrombosis. And that filling defect extends down the common iliac vein. Look at the difference in size in thigh circumference and the extent of that subcutaneous edema. You know, again, there goes that right common iliac artery passing across the anterior aspect of the left common iliac vein. Just a wonderful depiction of it and an extensive filling defect resulting from that thrombosis. Marked difference in the thigh circumference is again worth noting. So there is that right common iliac compressing the left common iliac vein and a filling defect that extends well into the left thigh.
So that is a case of may Thurner syndrome, anatomic compression of the left common iliac vein resulting in thrombosis. And that concludes my presentation on extremity CTA. Thank you for joining and we'll see you on another lecture soon.